Well, thank you for coming to this afternoon session. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Karsten Schumann. Sure, sorry, Schumann. Sherman. 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 Sherman, I apologize. Uh, who's a professor of computer science at IT University at Copenhagen. Uh, he has 10 years of experience conducting research in elections. Uh, he's an expert in election security, has written over 60 academic papers, contributed to books, and hacked at DEF CON 2017, the win voting machine, shortly after the voting uh, machine voting village opened. Uh, there we go, that's an odd sentence. Uh, he is a member of the computer science faculty at IT University of Copenhagen and leads the Center for Information Security Research. He has worked with the Carter Center at U.S. Council of Europe, uh, the Venice Commission, and the International IDEA in Sweden. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you. If I would have... <laughs> if I would have known that you read all of it, I would have shortened it. Okay. So, thank you very much for coming. Uh, somehow the power is not plugged in. I don't know. I hope I can survive all of it. Microphone, so, microphone. Okay. So, um... Hmm? Should I just take it like this? Okay, uh, let me take it like this. So I don't know why it flickers, but uh, okay. So I, uh, I, um, I'm the one, last DEF CON, who kind of looked at the WinVote voting machine, and I hacked it. And I've tried to do the same thing again here. So that is the WinVote voting machine from last, uh, from last year, and I brought a copy. But before I start, let me kind of take a much broader uh, way on elections. And I'm, I'm actually going to have pretty much the same conclusion as Alex uh, just before me, but I am uh, coming on a different way. So uh, the uh, Declaration of Human Rights actually kind of mandates that we all have, you know, genuine elections. Because it says the, free, the will of the people shall be on the basis uh, of the authority of government. And this shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections. Uh, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or equivalent free voting procedures. So the equivalent free voting procedures is there because of our friends from Switzerland who are still up to today standing on the marketplace and raising their hands. Okay, so this is why the, it looks like this, but the emphasis is really on genuine. And uh, in, in Europe, there's many countries that use paper ballots, okay? People make an X on a piece of paper and then other people are counting it. Actually, they're counting it not only once, they count, there are two different uh, groups of people counting it so that you have a lot of assurance that it's correct. Now, in the US, there's a lot of technology in the, in, in the game. And so the question really is, what kind of uh, you know, problem can you get with technology? And I think we all know the answer, um, but there's actually it's only half of the answer that we are always talking about. Because we always talk about cyber attacks. And you know, can you attack this thing? Can you change the votes? But that's actually, that's only half of the truth, because the other half is the alleged cyber attacks that people, opposition members, are coming and say, like, listen, a cyber, you can't trust the result because there was a cyber attack, but there wasn't really one. So in both cases, if there is a cyber attack or an alleged cyber attack, the result is the same. There's a lot of bad stories in the news, and people uh, start losing trust. And so I have exactly the same picture that uh, Alex had They're from Verified Voting. That's the current state of the use of technology in the United States. And uh, you can see that many states are actually using technology. Some are using paper ballots, but many are using technology. And there are five states that stick out. And it's exactly the same states that uh, Alex mentioned. It's Louisiana, it's Georgia, it's South Carolina, Delaware, and New Jersey. Because those five states have these voting machines that do not pro pro uh, produce a paper trail. So you cannot check retroactively if the machine was hacked or not. And you, when somebody claims that there was a cyber attack, you can't disprove that claim either. That is really, really problematic. So let me go and start with the WinVote voting machine. And uh, that's, it's here, that's how it looks. But uh, I'm just gonna hack it remotely. And the uh, nice thing about the WinVote voting machine for hackers is that you don't have to actually put in a USB stick or a smart card, but it always has Wi-Fi on. And uh, so let's kind of just look at it for a little while, how we do this, okay? Up here in the corner, there should be, and of course, I gave the same talk at uh, uh, Black Hat, and also there it didn't really work. Um, there should be, why, doesn't, why isn't it there? Machine, it, does, it, it should be ST something. Okay, let's try. 
I've just checked it sitting over there, and it was uh, it was there. Okay. Maybe I have to knock at it. <sighs> now, how can I hack it if it's not even online? Ah, oh, no, here it is. See, you just have to knock it. Uh, <laughs> it's the ST. Okay. This is a. It's a right. I, I mind, all of Virginia was using these machines from 2004 to 2014 for one Bush and uh, two Obama elections. Okay, so here's the password. It's A, B, C, D, E, of course. What else could it be? But it's a typical example, B, C, D, E, and we are connected. So any one of you can also connect to this machine if you want. And so now I'm connected with my, uh, with my laptop, okay? So the next thing I would like to do is I would like to hack it, of course. And for this, I have Kali, okay? And uh, let's just type in. Password is root, just in case you want to hack it, I'll just tell you, okay? Um, and it's a completely fresh thing. So if everything, there should be a directory, CD, blackhead, I did not go into this directory. And there's something called demo, which actually sets everything up. Um, and if everything goes well, in uh, just a minute, we actually have the uh, prompt for the Windows, uh, for, for, the, for the XP Windows machine here. And uh, we can then actually start executing um, code. We can kind of uh, do all kinds of damage, okay? So now it's trying to exploit. And here it is, okay? Can you see that says Windows, I mean, everyone always, I became very famous because I did this, but I actually didn't do very much because I'm not really a hacker. All you have to do is, uh, Kali Linux gives you, hey, try this as hack, and you say, do it, and then you're in, right? How, how, how interesting is this? So let me kind of try to make this bigger. If I only knew how to... How do you make this bigger? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't make it bigger. And now also... Okay. What did I do? Okay. But you see, Windows XP, all right? So... Um, yeah, because I don't have so much time, I could now go through the directories and look at all of this stuff. But that's actually the rest of my talk. Okay. So, uh, so the point is, these machines were in use, and you could have execu executed um, shell code, any kind of shell code that you wanted, from 2003 to 2014. This machine ran Windows, or ran, it's decommissioned, very good. Um, it ran Windows XP, Service Pack 0, has been never been updated, and this is why these uh, uh, vulnerabilities all exist. It's been never been updated because it had to be certified to be used, okay? And uh, there were about 4,000 units were deployed. I have uh, one here. Um, they have a small disk and a large disk, okay? Have a range of open ports, which really sets it up for hacking. I mean, really. It's the easiest hack that you can do, and you can really execute any kind of code on, the, on that machine. There has been a security analysis by the Virginia uh, Inter Inter um, Information Technology Agency in 2015 where they looked at it and said, like, this is a piece of junk. We can't use this anymore. Um, and then it was actually decommissioned. Um, and uh, because of the hack from DEF CON last year, actually, the state of Virginia decided to change the, uh, the laws and disallow any machine that doesn't produce a paper trail. So that's definitely a very, very good idea. Okay. So, since in the last year, I said, like, okay, can we figure out if somebody actually did something in the last eight years? Well, that would be the next natural question to ask, right? Did somebody actually hack that thing? And because I, uh, I know Carly, I tried to kind of boot Carly on the, on the voting machine. I thought it was a nice picture. But it was actually uh, more, so it, it didn't really work. And uh, at the end, what I've actually done is I kind of took out the, the disks. These are two SSD disks. And I kind of uh, did forensic images on them and then kind of studied the forensic images. Now, it's a comparative forensic analysis because, you know, looking for irregularities, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, except that you don't really know what the needle looks like and you don't know and you don't actually have the whole haystack. I mean, it's, a, it's actually kind of it's a ridiculously hard exercise, okay? And there's a lot of things that we found, and I call this irregularities because and it's without any interpretation of if it's malicious or, you know, maybe there are good explanations why this is, but I did not hunt for explanation for what I've seen. I've only observed things. Okay. So uh, we use autopsy for it, and autopsy is the, uh, the go-to tool for, um, 
forensic uh, analysis, and then people start with that, and then usually they dig deeper. But you know, and for me, my point is just, this is not good evidence. A machine like this, you don't get any evidence, you don't understand enough, and autopsy can already give this, okay? We didn't have any memory dumps, okay? Um, we don't even know who connected wirelessly to this machine. So that was my hope, there should be some log files and says like on election day, like 17 people actually connected to this. There's actually a report from early users of the machine in Virginia uh, where people complained that the machine was turning off while they were using it. The question is, did it turn off because a hacker turned it off, like I could turn off this machine? Or is it because, um, yeah, there was a bug in the program? But we had access to these log files and these SSD drives. And so I asked eight of my friends, who also got one of those, or I asked 20 of my friends, and eight actually replied, um, can I have your disks? And they gave me their disks. And so I can, big thanks to, uh, to Lyle, to uh, Joshua, to Noel, to Philip, to lots of people who kind of had the guts to unscrew the bottom of the thing, rip out the, the disks. Some actually mailed it to me from the US. Uh, and then I gripped it and I uh, put it back. So what did we find? Okay, forensic, uh, okay, that's pretty clear. We wanted to kind of understand what is the needle. We don't know exactly what the needle looks like, but we wanted to know somebody exploited vulnerabilities, did somebody ex install root kits, malware, were the machines used for other purposes? Alex, who just spoke, actually showed how to uh, run Pac-Man on one of those machines. Um, the NADAP machines was uh, shown to be a good chess computer by uh, Rob Gongbribe many years ago. Or did anyone mock with the binaries? So here's some kind of uh, things. So I just start off this thing and it says in the documents, recent documents folder. It says like from 2004, there's a file which I name I cannot really read because it has some Chinese characters in it. But it is actually um, a link to an MPEG-3 file. So I said like, Oh, MPEG-3 file, sounds interesting, so I googled it, and I just want you to hear it. So there, there is traces on these voting machines of MPEG-3 files that sound like this. And I said, like, that's weird, okay? That should not be. That should not be, that's weird. Okay, then I actually uh, did, you know, a little bit more. And you actually find traces of CD ripping software. So somebody, and I mean, I just looked at my machine, it looked like my machine was used to rip CDs. And there's actually a software to broadcast uh, MPEG-3s, which is called Wingsoft, which you can still find. Just have to type it in. And you know, that, uh, that was actually used to, uh, that's really weird. You click on it, it says like skin file not found. Okay, somebody deleted a skin file. But then at the beginning, I said like, oh my goodness, I found something. Somebody used my voting machine for MPEG-3 hacking. It's actually not entirely true, because I have eight machines and four of them have the same files, okay? So they, all of those files are on four of the machines. So that means there was a dirty image that somebody at this company who produced it must have ripped CDs with the good image, and then it was distributed over all of the machines, okay? So then I said, like, this is like entertaining. Okay, fine, let's just believe that this was not used for hacking. But you know, this, for, this, this is uh, still strange. Okay, so I actually went to some more serious stuff. And I went through all of the dates where there was like major uh, November elections in the United States. And that's how it looks like, right? So you have, a, there, there's a timeline feature in autopsy. It's a fantastic tool actually to kind of do some analysis. And all of the events actually are summarized. And that is for November 6, 2012, the presidential election where Obama was reelected. And you can see like, this, this green stuff means somebody has inserted USB sticks or something else, which is also normal because these machines actually have a USB stick start where, the, uh, where the, record, the results are recorded. Who knows what happens during the day? And then at the end, you know, everything's fine. So I went through all of these files and this all looks kind of, eh, looks reasonable, right? Looks reasonable. So that catches the, uh, the vote uh, register. These ones, uh, you know, did some updates to the, uh, uh, to the database. And at the end, all of the files were uh, printed uh, or, you know, were created, the report files and were zipped up. So that made sense. Then I said, like, let's look at 2013. <laughs> and in 2013, there's something really strange because, so I have eight machines and seven machines were used in the gubernatorial election in 2013. And on one of the machines, after polling day opened, before the polling day closed, 60 files in the Windows system directory were marked as of a flag as modified. And so I said, uh, even the cmd.exe file and even 
the uh, Winvote exe file is also flagged as modified. I said, like, what the hell is this? Right? I have no good, good uh, interpretation for it. But what I could see is that in this machine, somebody inserted some USB device. It actually says a root hub. I don't know exactly what it is. And inserted it into the machine, and then that triggered a bunch of changes to the system's file directory. I have no idea why. I don't know, I don't know anything. I just I checked at the end, you know, the, the current versions of cmd.exe and Winvote, they are actually all the same across all of the machines, but they were marked as modified. That's really strange. Okay. So I put all of these uh, findings like in one table. There are many more little things, right? But maybe let me just, the last one to kind of to comment on is the uh, gubernatorial election from 2005. Because uh, there I have eight machines, only five of those machines were used during that election, and three of these machines tried to dial out on their modem line. And uh, one machine dialed the wrong number and didn't get a dial tone, and the other two machines that were successfully and connected someplace with a dial tone. So uh, data was exchanged on those machines, you know exactly what time. It's actually very funny. These machines were decommissioned and they were given to me to Denmark, but all of the, the data is intact, right? Nobody wiped this. That's also kind of funny. Okay, so here, and then we have this, you know, most of those things actually look completely fine, right? Harmless, um, except the last one. Um, but you can actually, I have these, uh, I have the images here. They're on this laptop. So if anyone is interested in forensics, I, I'm happy to share them in the voting village and kind of look for more stuff. So what do we learn from all of this? Now, now I come to the part that actually is very, very close to also what, uh, what Alex said. We need evidence, right? Because what kind of evidence do you really prefer? This disk on module, this is actually a picture of the drives. These are SSD drives from 2002. They must have been very, very expensive. Um, or paper. What is better evidence? And so the, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if I, I, I definitely did not convince you, I hope at least, that, uh, you know, this was the best machine ever made. Okay, so you can't hack it. But uh, I think that's much, much better is actually having paper. And so you can do this risk limiting audit. And uh, I, you know, because Colorado is really leading in, in the implementation of these post-election audits, um, here's just an example of how such an audit actually would work. So during the 2016 election, where this machine was not used, okay, so the difference between Donald J. Trump and Hillary Clinton was about 130,000 votes. Okay, so that is the announced election result. And so if that is the wrong result, somebody must have tampered with at least 130,000 votes. And so the statistical arguments goes, can you look at the paper trail and draw a random sample to find evidence that this tampering has actually taken place? And if you can, then the risk limiting audit method will actually autocorrect and say like, you know, now you have to look at a bigger sample. Or at the very end, it says like you have to do a full recount. And that's exactly what you want, right? If you can't trust the evidence, you have to recount everything. It's actually the perfect uh, procedure. And if the, as long as the margins are wide, like here, 130,000, you can actually kind of get away with very small sample sizes. Okay, so the sample here that you have to pick is 142 ballots for, the, uh, uh, for that particular race, the presidential race 2016 in Colorado. And uh, that is not precincts, that's not ballot boxes. You have to just draw 142 ballots, but they have to be truly random. And in order to kind of get something which is truly random, you know, I can't believe it, I'm a computer scientist, you have to use those 10-sided dice. And these 10-sided dice are actually from Ron Rivest, I, I assume, and that's a, an election official, maybe the election official in Colorado actually kicking off the audit for the 2016 election. Yes. The state of uh, risk limiting audits, or you know, any kind of auditing, is not as good as it could be. Because the darker, the better. In many states, so Louisiana, um, Georgia, South Carolina, and th those states up there, Delaware and New Jersey, they can't audit anything because they have no paper. The only thing you can do there is actually kind of check these, these machines. And uh, that is kind of very worrisome. And again, for me, a risk limit in audit actually serves two purposes. Number one, it shows that a cyber attack, if it happened, had no influence on the election result. 
And number two is, if there was an alleged cyber attack, it also did not have any uh, effect on the election results. And so this is why a risk limiting audit is actually a confidence building methodology, and it's actually quite, quite good. So I have only one conclusion for my talk. Use paper and do your audits. And uh, you know, I'm not sure how many election officials are here, but I think really this is an important message. And I think it's exactly the same as such that Alex has just sent, and I just double up on him. Thank you. So the question was, if you have a secure connection between different devices and uh, to some kind of central uh, server and all of the uh, connections, everything is kind of safe. So we have to think about who is the attacker and what can the attacker do. And the attacker might be an insider attacker. Actually kind of, you know, maybe Alex is the insider attacker with his ma magic cards. He inserts them and the ballots are changed before they're actually being submitted. That's, where, that's, that's a, a true problem. And uh, when I did the forensic analysis, you know, the, uh, the bi the, the, all of the binaries that are actually, you know, the, the code that is in the system, there are hash files that look actually, yeah, that's a known file that looks, looks the way it should look, and so on and so forth. It checks those kind of things as well. But it could be that uh, if, you, uh, if you only have a system where somebody installed malware on it, you know, it changes the, the votes exactly how Alex's machine just did it, and then submits the wrong results, how will you ever figure out? And the problem really is, is not just that the uh, results are correct or not. The problem really is the trust and the confidence in that the result is correct. And uh, you know, we can talk about as much technology in the election as we want. There will be always a way to kind of attack it. And that is not, uh, that's not confidence building. And so the paper thing actually kind of shorts cut this entire discussion and, uh, and make sure that you, know, you have an independent verification of whatever went into the process, namely the ballots, and whatever came out of the process, actually are in correspondence. Are you saying that maybe every person that votes, they get a receipt that their information is correct, but then how do you know the information ultimately it summarizes correctly? So the, How's the paper going to help there? Um, that's exactly what this risk limiting audit is doing. Because when you are drawing a random set, so in the um, the fire marshal again. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so basically in this example, right, you have counted up all of the ballots and you come up with a result. Now you want to know if the result is correct. So the only way how this result could not be correct is if somebody has tampered with 133,000 ballots in the ballot boxes. And so now you're looking for statistical evidence that uh, those ballots have been tampered with. And so the way how you do it is you kind of set a level of confidence. And we have set the level of confidence to 5%. So that means we are 95% sure that it's correct after we have uh, looked at 142 ballots. It's a very, very small number. But this is exactly how you check the aggregation. The aggregation you kind of check by looking at the margin that would make a difference. And then you kind of look for evidence in the paper trail that um, something went wrong, either when you computed the result or you know somebody actually kind of tempered with the paper trail itself. That's it, yeah. Any other questions?